people have an expectation of what I'm supposed to be like. I'm sorry. I told somebody the other day, I'm sorry if I don't fit that, yeah. that, but that's not my problem. That's yours. Yeah. It was this guy and he was kind of upset that I behaved the way I did is what it seemed like. And I thought, oh, you're sitting in judgment on me because you have an expectation that a woman my age should be a certain way. Mm -hmm. Fuck you and your expectation. I am what I am, and I'm grateful for it, right? <laughs> By the time he left, he shook my hand and said, I want you to know this has been really interesting. <laughs> and I'm hoping that he has a broader view of what people can be. Yeah. Because I think that's important because I am a woman of a certain age. I'm supposed to behave like your grandmother. Oh, I'm sorry. <laughs> yeah. Maybe your grandmother should behave like me. Yeah. She'd probably have a lot more fun. <laughs> That was Dibby Fletcher. I'm Jamie Brissick. You're listening to Soundings, brought to you by The Surfer's Journal. The Surfer's Journal is a reader-supported publication made possible by sponsorship from Birdwell, FCS, Patagonia, Rainbow, Vans, Visla, and Yeti. More book than magazine, it delivers 120 pages of independent storytelling in each issue, covering the people, culture, travel, and art of surfing. Members receive the magazine six times yearly, in addition to unlimited access to the magazine's archives, discounts in its store, plus subscriber-only access to additional digital content, exclusive film screenings, and sponsor offers. To subscribe, please visit surfersjournal.com. So, Dibby Fletcher. I'm reading from Dibby's bio on the back of the Fletcher book that Rizzoli published not long ago. Dibby Fletcher is a writer, unofficial COO of the Astrodeck Surfing Equipment Company, and the matriarch of the Fletcher family. I've known Dibby for many, many years, and uh, I've always found her incredibly passionate and engaging, and she has a lot to say about pretty much everything. I thought it would be appropriate to have this podcast come on the back of her son Nathan's podcast because while Nathan was describing his horrific wipeout at Chopu, I had this thought. I, I wondered, what would it be like for a mother to watch their son be eaten alive by a wave in that manner? Um, so we are upstairs at the Astrodeck compound in San Clemente. We're surrounded by tons of surfboards, tons of art that Dibby's made. She's a visual artist, makes paintings, makes sculptures, etc., and um, I feel like I'm, we're kind of in, in this museum. Um, so here we go. So Dibby, you're the wife of Herbie, the mother of Christian and Nathan, the sister of Joyce, the, the daughter of Walter and Flippy, and the grandmother of Grayson, and Laser, and most recently? Jetson. Jetson. Um, I've known you guys since 1982, I would say. And what's nice is I spoke with your son, Nathan, recently, and I reminded him of a NSSA contest at Ventura where I was talking to he and Christian and he said, come up to the truck. We're going to have a sandwich. And I met you and Herbie for the very first time. And you served me a vegetarian sandwich with avocado and uh, alfalfa sprouts. And you were the first vegetarian I ever met. You know, Sonny said something really interesting about that because he came to stay at our house once when he was really young in the Palisades. And he goes, you know, I'm a meditarian. <laughs> I thought that was so funny. And he goes, I was so shocked, right, when you wanted to serve me these vegetables. And see, I didn't think anything about it. My kids were vegetarians and I j it was just what I did, right? And so it was so funny because he goes, well, you know, I'm a serious meditarian. And I thought that that was really very amusing. Yeah, well, it's interesting because the, the, the generation that I came in on, and I would say to some degree, Christian and Nathan came in on as well, although they were yours and Herbie's uh, children. There was like this, this, for lack of a better term, uh, countercultural, alternative, hippie, new age, whatever you want to call it, the 70s period and 60s. late 60s. So I know a little bit about the story, but for, for our listeners, I think you met Herb, you ran away to Hawaii together to the North Shore, maybe? Yes, I met Herbie, I believe when I was 13, I met him on the beach in Makaha. My dad was a surf contest judge. And my sister was um, competing in the contest, in the Makaha Surf Contest. What year? 64, 65, okay. something like that. Okay. I, I don't know. I'd have yep. to do the math, and I'm sure. terrible at math. Yeah. I'm great at a lot of things. Math is not one of them. <laughs> anyway, so we met, and 
and it was nice. And I'm and in fact, I didn't meet him there. I met him at the Pokai B uh, at the Pokai Bay Beach Cabanas. He had come looking for his surfboard, so he came to see Corky Carroll. My sister was on the same surf team, and so he came to see Corky Carroll. Had told him that my sister had his surfboard, so I was practicing tandem on on the grass with my tandem partner Don Hansen. And so Herbie came to look for a surfboard and I said, oh yeah, I think my, you know, you can talk to my sister, blah, blah, blah. And so I didn't see him again until the next year I saw him at Makaha again. And I believe I was 14 at the time. He thought I was too young. I thought he was too young. He didn't have a car or anything, you know, I mean, come on, right? I mean, there are, a, <laughs> there are things about dating, right? <laughs> anyway, so we came back and he, he lived, in, he, he was in Huntington and I lived at Capistrano Beach and we started seeing each other. And it was really, and it was nice. It was kind of a, it was an interesting relationship. And um, on and off again, he'd go to Maui to go surfing and all this, right? And so by the time I was 16, I decided it was time for me to leave home. And Herbie was living in Dana Point at the time. So I left home and I went to Dana Point. And I said, oh, Herbie, I've decided to run away from home. I'm going to come live with you. And I think Herbie was a bit stunned, right? Mm -hmm. So we were here and we stayed in Dana Point for about a week and we decided, well, we better leave. And so we went to the North Shore and we were on the North Shore and we and Herbie ran into Diffenderfer, mm -hmm. right? And said, hey, what's what's going on? He goes, Dibby's father's here looking for you. So we went and we went to Maui. And anyway, my dad was, he was okay. My mom wasn't thrilled with the idea. Yeah, it was kind of that you made your bed, you lie in it kind of mentality. But it's okay. Let's see. That was how many years ago? I think Herbie and I have lived together now 55 years. We've been married 53. Wow. Impressive. And so how old were you when you had Christian, your first child? I had Christian a month after I was 19. Mm -hmm. Nathan, a couple of years later? Uh-huh. And what an adventure. What an adventure. So what, what were those early years like? Um, Herbie was... So you guys were doing Astrodeck, I'm guessing? No. Uh, Herbie owned Clark Home Hawaii. Okay. My dad's good friend, Gordon Clark, who created Clark Foam. When I was eight years old, he lived next door to me while he was recovering from back surgery. And so Beach Road had no one around. And so I used to go visit him every day. But that is when he really, um, Hobie came to him. Hobie's business had become so busy that he came to Grubby, who had actually graduated from college with an engineering degree. And he was recuperating from his back surgery. He had... Uh, a bunch of vertebrates in the bottom of his spine fused mm -hmm. from a car accident he had been in. And so while he was laying there, Hobie said, you know, why don't you work on this? And so at the time, that's when he kind of created the process for blowing foam. Okay. And so he was an interesting character. And so as I said, I knew him all this time. And so when Herbie and I were living on the North Shore, um, I talked to him and he was hoping that we'd renege on it because my dad signed for the credit, right? And so he was kind of a practical joker and he said, oh, I, I hope you guys really don't kind of make a success of this. And I thought, oh, that's nice. Anyways, we had the Clark Foam franchise for, for the Hawaiian Islands. Okay. And what about your father and uncle, I guess it would be, right? Uh -huh. I know, but for the average listener, what did they do exactly? My father, okay, my father, Walter, and my uncle, Flippy, um, when my father was a young man, he he was in the Navy and he was stationed in Hawaii and he had radio duty at night in Honolulu. And so he'd spend his days out on the beach of Makaha shaping surfboards. And so he was one of the big wave riders out there and he would take pictures and send them back to California. So he was responsible for many of the old time surfers that you hear about nowadays going to Hawaii to go surfing. Mm -hmm. So he was stationed in the Navy there. And when his tour of duty was done, that was in the fifties, like 50, I want to say 52, 53. It was right when the Korean war was just ending. Right. And he came back to California and his father, Rube Hoffman owned a woolens company. It had, he had been what they'd call a jobber. He sold woolens to a lot of the manufacturers. So when Walter came back to California, he's thinking, well, how do I get a customer, you know, like at the beach? And so he had been so influenced by all the Aloha prints in Hawaii mm -hmm, of that time. Mm -hmm. That was a time of um, from here to eternity. Yes. If you remember the great Aloha shirts, oh, yeah, for sure. right, with Frank Sinatra and Cliff Montgomery wearing them. Yep. So it was right at that time. And so Walter came back and he said, well, you know, he told his dad, you know, I think I could really do a good job, right? And so he started doing Aloha prints and selling them. That's when the sports 
manufacturer's industry was in its infancy. Okay. I think that there was like Catalina and a couple of the really old brands mm -hmm. that were more like swimsuits. Yep. And this was right after, okay, when the Korean War wound down, there was a huge aerospace industry mm -hmm. in California. Yes, yep. And the materials from aerospace is what changed surfing. When foam and fiberglass was introduced to the surf world, it took the surfboard from 100 pounds to, let's say, 35, 40 pounds. Yeah. So that opened surfing up to the entire world. Mm -hmm. And one thing I think that's really relevant that no one really has ever talked about was the aluminum. They made the sliding glass door and that opened the world to outdoor living. Uh -huh. So here you had the Aloha shirt, the sliding glass door, yep. right? And you had that idea of that kind of casual California outdoor living. Yes, yeah, yeah. And so Walter was able to kind of, it was a time, he was in the right place at the right time. And that idea that from here to eternity, that kind of casual sportswear look. Yeah. And there was a lot of um, immigrants from Europe that had come here after the Second World War. So the colleges were filled with people that were teaching great art. Mm -hmm. And it was a moment of expansion in California with the suburbs coming around. There was a GI Bill that allowed all these, um, uh, all these GIs to go to college. Yep. And so it was just this huge push of this kind of, it was the first time after the First World War, the Second World War, and the Korean War, it was that first time of that real peace and prosperity. Yes. And it kind of, uh, it kind of came in with that, that California lifestyle, that right. easy kind of living that was really sent across the globe. Yes. Yep. You know, and yep. I think, and so Walter was kind of a part of that. Did he create it? Of course not. It was a huge push from all directions. Yep. But he would become the supplier of textiles to most of the surfwear brands we know. Yeah. Absolutely. Until they got so big that they started going offshore. Yes. But he gave them their first credit. And so he really helped to start what we consider like the surf kind of company. Yep. And then your sister, a, a world champ, a multiple world champ, I think. Yes. Mm -hmm. And um, did you ever surf? Do you surf? I don't surf now. Yes, I did. I was a tandem. I surfed tandem and all that. Uh -huh. It was okay. Not your thing? No. I was always a dancer and my sister was so good. You could have never kind of um, competed against her. Sure. Do you understand? I understand. And I just wasn't, I mean, I went out body surfing. I went diving with my dad. In fact, we used to go diving in front of our house all the time for lobsters and abalone. So you'd catch lobster and abalone and bring them in for dinner. Yeah. So I was a water person, yep. but I just never was a surfer. Yep. I remember at those contests, not long after you gave me the vegetarian sandwich, my first vegetarian sandwich, <laughs> You, I would see you guys at, at the NSSAs up and down the coast of California, and you would set off on a run and then you, I'd see you coming back an hour or more later on so, on maybe soft sand on the beach. Oh yeah, I used to run twenty miles a day every single day. Wow. So I was always see I've always been an exercise person, athlete or whatever. You know, I got was a, I was ballroom dancer. I've been a stone sculptor, a painter, a writer, and I like to do it all the way. Yeah. You know, to where you experience that sense of losing yourself in it, yep. right? Yeah. And so, but I used to, <laughs> I used to run from Turtle Bay to Pipeline and back. You know, I used to run from Herbie would let me off at Nana Cooley and I'd run to Makaha and back. And, you know, wow. I was a, I liked it. Uh -huh, uh -huh. You, you kind of lose your mind. Yeah, sure. What was it like in the early days raising a family being, you know, you and Herbie both being very, very young, um, surfing being the center of your lifestyle, um, Kristen and Nathan getting into surfing very, very young. And then you it, with Astrodeck, you had all these great surfers. I mean, the best surfers in the world were kind of in the orbit. I remember the great... Um, Astrodeck ads at Jerry Lopez place where you it would be about 30 or 40 people. And if I went through every single surfer, I would know and they would be like a favorite surfer. Well, it was kind of interesting because surfers are very reticent about trying new things. People don't think that, but they really are. Mm -hmm. They're very they're very much traditionalists. Mm -hmm. So when Herbie started Astrodeck, first of all, he had to quit her doing Herbie Fletcher surfboards because shops wouldn't carry Astrodeck because they thought it was a conflict of interest. Okay. So, okay. So he's doing Astrodeck. Well... To get people to ride Astrodeck was a whole nother story because Herbie is a, he's very interesting. Herbie is an inventor. And so I usually get stuck doing the day-to-day -day business. <laughs> Somebody had to do it. Mm -hmm. But anyway, but he's very much an inventor. And so he's thinking to himself, you know, I can see this changing everything. I, I can see it changing 
showers, how you take a shower. He put it on tennis rackets. He put it on baseball grips. He used it on golf clubs. We He used it everywhere, right? But so when it first started with Astrodeck, He'd go down to the beach and he'd put it on the, the 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 surfers boards and everything, right? And so there was no money, and so he always liked taking movies after being after being the star in them, like with Greg McGillivray of Free and Easy and all this. He really enjoyed the idea of making movies, yep. and so he got these surfers and he goes, "Hey, you know what? I'm I'm gonna make some like movie ads, right? And so maybe this will make you more." more of more value to other sponsors that yep. maybe can pay you something yeah and so it was kind of an interesting time because it was just when surfing was starting to be when surfers were starting to be identified with companies right yeah. and so they stopped kind of fraternizing together you know it mm -hmm. became oh i surf for this company so i can't really do anything with you and i surf for this company and so that was kind of interesting and so I, we looked at Wave Warriors as kind of a coming together of the tribe yeah. because it was the only time that the surfers then, just like with that photo shoot, it didn't matter what brand they surfed for. They were all kind of Wave Warriors yes. with that Astro deck. Yep. And I thought that that was really kind of an interesting thing that that happened like that. And with Herbie doing those rectangles, those, those broken boards, mm -hmm. it was... What, how many years later? He did those photo shoots in the late 80s, early 90s. So then he started doing those rectangles. Again, It the boards are all from the greatest surfers, all broken up pipeline. So he brought them all back together again. Yep, but the this sculptures, time, yeah. But this time it was broken. Yeah. And it was, and you look at it and you go, okay, so in 40 years, it went from that photo of all those surfers together to the pieces of all broken boards put together. Yep. And to me, that was a new kind of Wave Warriors idea. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. And you look at it and go, wow, 40 years it took from that kind of iconic photo of all the surfers into what's left of all the broken boards with all the logos on them. Yeah. No, it's like the, 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 like the arc of life and, and, and death. And, and, the end. and yeah. you just go, I, and, and so I thought that's so interesting if you can look at it like that. Yes. Yeah, yeah. When you think back on those times, what are the highlights for you? What were what were what were the what were the fun moments? There was so many of them. It, the, it was so different then. Mm -hmm. it, it really was. I mean, when you'd go to the beach and stuff, there wasn't. It was starting to be very, um, like a, just like I said, it was starting to be. Uh, people were starting to kind of generate. Oh, I'm with this company and I'm with that company, right? But it was still much more rock and roll. Mm -hmm. It was much looser. Mm -hmm. It was fun. There was a lot of music that was happening that you'd go to concerts and everything. Herbie was involved with a guy that did a lot of Avalon attractions. And so we'd get tickets for everybody. Mm -hmm. And so we'd go and have all these great parties and fun time. And so to me, in a way, it wasn't so serious. Yeah, It was still kind of a party yes. where now it's Oh God, I'm in, I'm into my just like now everybody says oh I'm a vegan you go oh who cares sure you know just stop will will you yeah because it's like it's this badge oh this is how I identify myself how about just being human and going out and doing your your best job uh, no absolutely I mean you got to experience surfing to my mind in a very interesting time and you did sort of ride it from being as I say, I, I don't like the word, but countercultural and being kind of alternative and, and being rebellious, let's say, to, to it becoming sort of mainstreamified as it is now. But um, I think back on those times, and I'm, I, you know, my period was along with Christian Nathan, the 80s. I remember being on tour with Nathan, with Christian. And um, I'm grateful for those times. I wish there were more money then because I would have a, own a few houses around the world if it were today. But... No, you wouldn't. You would have been dumb like everybody else. <laughs> but but the the experience was um, it was so adventurous because it did feel like we were pulling pulling one over. It felt like a scam. Well, you know what? The thing that I miss is the characters. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Because see, to me, what happened as these companies got bigger. Their idea was just to sell more product, right? Well, to sell that more product, they needed the mom's credit card. So that means they had to sell to back to school. So when they sold to back to school, all of a sudden, a junior high principal is dictating what image can be on that shirt. Mm -hmm. And so it became completely whitewashed. Yeah. And so they had to get rid of all the characters because the characters didn't check at retail. For sure. And so to me, it became very homogenized. And way less interesting. Yeah, no, I know you. We've talked about that. It over became the years. It, and 
So, see, I always say, once they turned it into a sport, they kind of killed the golden goose because mm -hmm. no, it was no longer a lifestyle. When they turned it into a sport in their need to sell more and more product and to appeal to a broader base, it wasn't rock and roll anymore. Yeah. It was just like, you know, Hannah Montana and Disneyland. Do you understand? Yeah. Right. Yeah. So it was going to a younger and younger kid because they felt that that was where the revenue stream was. And so it wasn't. Rock and roll. It was, you know, I mean, all of a sudden you have to appeal to an eight, an eight year old's mom. Yeah. Sure. And so that really changed the complexion of what surfing was. And then, you know, with the Olympics and all this, it's that same, you know. Mm -hmm. And so surfing to me, to attain that, it lost something that made it uniquely different. Yeah. I feel the same. The, 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 the part of surfing that attracted me and it was a way to rebel against my parents and break from the Catholic upbringing I had and, and the suburban upbringing I had, I felt like I, I, I was um, in this sport full of misfits and they embraced me and I felt like a misfit and that's why I love surfing. And then I watched in a very short time, in 10 years, it became, I, I felt at odds with the surf world that I was a part of. And I'm talking probably the late 80s, well, early When they 90s. kick Christian out, come on. Yeah, no, let's talk you about know, that. You know, come on. Tell, tell, you just go, really? Tell the story so I don't care if you liked him or not. He was still a great surfer. Yes. And that was the point. Pretty soon it became a personality thing. Do you understand? It yeah. was no longer about surfing and about per pushing surfing forward. Like I said, it was about checking at retail for a junior high vice principal. When did Christian got what he was cut out of the PSA, was it? Or was it something else? Oh, I don't know. It, he was cut out of everything. They they didn't want Johnny Rotten surfing. And you go, <laughs> why not? Oh, I thought that was fun. Uh -huh. And see, and I did think it was fun. See, I didn't rebel against my parents. My dad was a surfer. So to me, it wasn't rebellious yeah. to be in the surfing world. Mm -hmm. It was just what I knew. Mm -hmm. And my dad's friends were all characters, whether it was grubby, whether it was Belzy, These people were all characters. Yep. So- when I looked at it, they weren't like my, the kids I went to school with whose parents, I mean, their dads wore like the alpaca sweater and stuff. I mean, my dad was barefoot with Makaha Surf Club sweatshirt on. Yeah. So my dad was Christian and Nathan. So to me, it felt very comfortable. When I didn't feel comfortable any longer was when they were turning that surfer into that, um, uh, you know what was uh what was cleaver you know uh a wally cleaver yeah from... when they started turning him into that you just go i left that world sure. i didn't want to be in that world and all of a sudden you've taken this thing that was really different and unique and you've turned it back into that because that was the comfort zone yeah i felt that very much but so here's an interesting one i i follow you on instagram and you do a hashtag fletcher dna and you're talking about you being raised in a family where it seems like you're what self-expression was was supported, promoted, encouraged. And it seems like you've raised your children that way. And then it seems like your kids have raised their kids to be that way. And so we have um, a lot of strong individuals in your family. How, how, what was, what, how did you and Herbie raise Christian and Nathan? Let's start there. We just took them everywhere with us. They were just like buddies, right? And I didn't think that... It, and, and so Herbie was so... Herbie just loved surfing, just loved it, right? And he just felt, okay, surfing is so stale. And so he thought, boy, it's going in the air. And so he took Christian and Nathan to the skate park. And he'd go ride his he'd ride his mountain bike in the skate park and the big O and all that. And he took them by Sound Spectrum on the way so they'd get the newest tunes. Mm -hmm. And so we raised them just like we were. Yeah. You know, and I didn't I didn't think so much about, oh, you know, I'm the parent, you know, and you're the kid. And yes, we were parents and we loved them and they had boundaries. There were certain things that I expected of them, right? Like not to lie, not to cheat, not to steal. Yep. There are certain things that I expected and they knew that those expectations, they knew of those expectations and that was fine. But I wanted them to feel free and have fun and go to the beach and go surfing and go skating and give it their best shot. Mm -hmm. Did you know that they would find their way as professional surfers and that would sort of provide an income or were you concerned about them getting normal jobs let's say i i didn't know what a what what was a normal job yeah. i mean i never thought about them doing that and in school i took them out of school very early on there was problems in school when they would tell me oh christian did this or nathan did that and i'm looking at them going well 
that there's nothing wrong with that, right? And I just kind of looked at a lot of the school scene, like I wouldn't pick this person as my good friend. So why would I let them have eight hours with my kid telling my kid what they think? Mm -hmm. Honestly, yeah. I look at school now and go, boy, I would never put my kids in school now. Yep. And so I saw it then. Christian and Nathan both had learning disabilities. And it was really interesting because I got to take them. When they said, oh, they're not very smart, I'm thinking, they're really smart. There's got to be something that's organically wrong. And so I searched and searched and searched. And finally, I found this thing called vision therapy. And they both had learning disabilities. Each one had a different different learning disability. But they gave them the most unique exercises to clear it up. It, it's A learning disability isn't so much a disability. It's about how you perceive things. Uh -huh. Christian only used one side of his mind. So it wasn't diagnosed until he was about in seventh grade when you have to go into the other side of the mind. Mm -hmm. So they had him um, do the marine crawl at, because you go through the left and right hemisphere. Okay. So it teaches you how to access both sides of the mind. Uh -huh. So I spent a long time doing this. It was very costly. And so I said, okay, Christian, you've got all the tools now to learn. You're just on your way. And he goes, yeah, but now I'm going to choose not to. <laughs> so I <laughs> I said, okay, but at least it's your choice. Uh huh. Yeah. I've given you the tools. Yeah, sure. And if that's your choice, that's your choice. Yes. Which I thought was kind of shocking. Yeah. And I was kind of, you know, <laughs> yeah. let down. But the point was, is that you knew then he was so smart that he had those tools and he could use them. Yeah. yeah. No, he was very strong individual from a young age. And I remember that because I, I mean, I feel like I grew up alongside your kids. Yeah. And see, he was always interesting in the way he, he always, my parents lived at the beach and the, uh, and he'd go surfing out in front. Okay. So he'd call me up in the evening and say, okay, I'm going to stay here, you know, because I just want to surf in the morning and then I'll go to school. I'd say, well, Christian, you don't have any clothes to wear. He goes, oh, it's okay. I'll wear tutus. That was my mom. He'd wear plaid, you know, pedal pushers with his Doc Martens on. He was the only person I knew that could have cared less what the other kids thought. Uh -huh. He was going however he thought. He didn't care if it was his grandmother's clothes. And I thought there's something very freeing about that. Yeah. To have so much self-confidence or sense of self that you can go out without any of the preconceived ideas of how people think you should be. Yes, for and sure. So, and so I like that. I thought, oh, that's really great. Yep. And you and Herbie were both so creative and so expressive. And I remember at that time you were making a lot of visual art, right? Sc uh, paintings and sculptures. Yes. Uh-huh. I did a lot of painting. So once the kids got older and we'd go to school and stuff, you have a, hour, a, block, a block of time. Mm -hmm. So you can run 20 miles. Okay, then what, right? <laughs> so... Anyway, so I started doing a lot of painting, and I started doing a lot of stone carving. I shaped a lot of surfboards. I did a lot, uh, all sorts of different artistic things that I liked, and it was fun and interesting, right? And I thought it was a good thing for the kids to see that I was more than just their mom. Mm -hmm. Because I didn't surf, see, they could look at Herbie, and Herbie's doing toe-ins and all this stuff, which is really rad, right? Yep, yep. And so I'm the mom, right, making the sandwiches and all that. And so they'd kind of look at me and go... And so I did all these other things. And like Christian looks at me and he goes, well, why would you do that? And I said, to prove that I can. Yeah. And he go, that's demented. <laughs> I thought I was being this great example. Yeah. You know. But it's great to be talking to you now because I think um, your husband's very high profile. Your your son, your two sons are very high profile. Your grandson, Grayson's very high profile in the surf skate world. Um You've all, but you've always had your own stuff going on. You've never been. You're not like a, a housewife by any means. And I've seen. I've that. run Astrodeck for the last I don't know, twenty years. Yes. So, so tell know. me what's been like running Astrodeck. Well, Herbie didn't mind because everybody thought he did it. <laughs> <laughs> so I laughed and I said, "Oh my God, you're so far up." But anyway, it was. It's a lot of it I liked. We've gotten to do so many things. We've been, we've manufactured clothing. We've done wakeboards, snowboards. We've done outerwear. I mean, Herbie and I have, we've made movies. We have done so many things. We did it our way with our dime. Yeah. So there was never anybody to tell us how to do things. And so Herbie and I, Herbie loves new. You know what I mean? And so it's, oh, well, let's do this. Maybe we were too dumb to know we couldn't, mm -hmm, mm -hmm. you know? And so we've done all the trade shows. We've done uh, SIA. We did ASR. We did rock and roll concerts. The kids became a band. We did the Cabo contest. So we've done all these things. And so Herbie and I sometimes laugh about it and say, boy, we have had 
the most interesting life of opportunity that we created the opportunity. Yeah. Well, you know, the thing I remember vividly is, and, and this goes back to the vegetarian sandwich, is you guys were so inclusive. I mean, you always brought people in. Um, Astrodeck at that time, I'm talking in the 80s, they're, all the best surfers in the world were using Astrodeck, Astrodeck and were probably family friends with you guys. Oh, yeah. And um, I just think of all the years I've known, you know, Herbie and seeing him on the North Shore. He's all, it's always been, come on in, come meet this person. And what, it's sort of, um, it's giving you guys this big life that, and a big social life of all these wonderful people, right? Well, just like you were saying, I do Instagram. Well, what's really kind of funny is I have 80, 85% male followers, right? And they send me stuff. I have so many guys send me stuff I, that they think I'll think is funny or whatever. And I always thank them, right? And so I thought, isn't that interesting? I have all these guys from all over the world sending me the, the most unique, weird, funny stuff. I mean, little kids stuff, pet stuff, because you've seen how I do Instagram. I mm -hmm. just do anything I think it's interesting yeah. or funny, right? Yeah. I don't care. I don't do surf or anything else. I just do whatever. I've already got canceled once. I said, oh, when granny gets canceled, there's really a problem. <laughs> but, but anyway, and so I just thought, isn't that interesting that I'm still so available that guys will send me this stuff. And I think that for a woman my age, that's very interesting that they kind of look at me and I think it is something that they can look at and say, oh, see, she's so much fun that I think that that's a great role model for other women. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. And I think it's important because I think things got so serious that people have forgotten to laugh at themselves yeah. and to have this sense of joy yeah, because, and I think especially in the last few years that people have really changed their demeanor and you go, you know what? The cells in your body need to laugh. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm, mm -hmm. Yeah, you've always had a great sense of humor. I remember um, those years, it would have been the late nineties at when surfing magazine was, was shared the same building as Astrodeck. And there were a couple of spots for Astrodeck. And if any of the surfing magazine people stole your spot, you'd yell at them. And so they were all so afraid of you, but I would go over and see you and, Herbie, and you'd be laughing at basically scaring all these people. Uh, well, it's great. Just like my kids said, oh, my God, everybody's afraid of you. I said, I know it really works, doesn't it? <laughs> and so whenever anybody would ask them for pads, they say, oh, go ask my mom. And so then they'd say, so no one would bother us anymore. Right. And I said, I think it's very funny that everybody's so afraid of me. I said, but it kind of works. And I said, it's okay. You're listening to Soundings with Jamie Brissick. This podcast and the Surfer's Journal are made possible due to TSJ's subscribing members and through the sponsorship of Birdwell, FCS, Patagonia, Rainbow, Vans, Visla, and Yeti. To learn more about the Surfer's Journal and its sponsors, or to subscribe, visit surfersjournal.com. Now back to our guest, Dibby Fletcher. So the years thinking of a lot of years on the North shore with your family, you've got Herbie like riding, charging giant YMA waves on a jet ski. And there's that one fantastic piece of footage where it's like, it's like a rodeo where he's just bouncing was as a, as a wife. And then as a mother watching both Kristen Nathan do the same, similar things. Was that scary? Chicks and drugs. That's scary. Mm. Mm -hmm. <laughs> they went out there and did that stuff because yep. they loved it. Mm -hmm. If it made me upset, I didn't watch and I didn't give them my opinion because they don't need that to yep. carry that. They need to f be absolutely fearless and to be absolutely on their game when they go do something like that. I do like it if they just send me the video because I know they made it, right? And of course, sometimes it was very... Um, nerve wracking but i'll tell you something herbie and i have gotten a terrible accident four guys ran into us on purpose on the north shore and it really changed our lives there was nothing we could have done to avoid it um what happened tell me it was a saturday morning christian was what he was two years old and we were in the in a volkswagen and we pulled out that's when you know where uh where foodland is yep well there was that little wine mail store there at the time okay right yep. and so we were pulling around the corner these guys came and they were. we were in a Volkswagen Bug. They were in a 59 Chevy, the ones with the big fins. Mm -hmm. They came over the double E L line and Herbie's, I mean, this is Saturday morning and Herbie, we're looking at them. You're thinking, okay, God, step in. Mm -hmm. Okay, step in. So Herbie pulled all the way in the parking lot. They went right into the parking lot and they hit us. They hit Herbie right in the side. Uh, 
of the VW and his leg was completely crushed. You know, I mean, they said, oh, you'll never surf again. We're going to take it, amputate your leg. But the point of the story is we could not have avoided that. So if you're going to go and you're going to live a big life, go do it. Mm-hmm. You can't be afraid of what's going to happen. Yep. You yep. said they did it on purpose where they were mm-hmm. aiming for you guys? Mm-hmm. Did, did Herbie drop in on one no, of them? No, they just got out of the car and they just said, oh, we want to kill you, Hallie's. Jesus, that's intense. Um, interesting. The I, I spoke with uh, Nathan a couple weeks ago, maybe even a week ago about his wipeout in that incredible Chopu wave. And that, that's like one of the epic wipeouts of all time. Right. I mean, it's not just a wipeout. There's a lot more that goes on. But in the end, the wave sort of eats him alive. Um, but uh, when you saw that clip as 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 Nathan's mother, what was that like for you? Obviously, he had survived because you wouldn't be... And, and so you just go, oh my God, he made it, right? Yeah. And so you go, but, but there was... I'm sure that... He came face to face with his own mortality, and I think that that's good for all of us. You, yeah, you know, no. I mean, it makes you really appreciate your life, and yeah. it gives you a deeper understanding. And I think you know that, just like with that car accident or with all the rad things that happened to Herbie, you understand. You know, you've got to have faith, yeah, right? Yeah. Because even if you're hiding in the closet, if it's going to hit you, it's going to hit you. Yeah. Sure. Yeah. <laughs> and so I think. And yes, having the kids, but I'll tell you something, whether it's drugs or making bad decisions, that is much more costly than being on a big wave where you're really ready for it, right? Yeah. I think there's other things in life that can wipe you out a lot more seriously. Yes. And the big waves and the surfing is it's it, your your spirit is sort of attuned to nature and something good, whereas the other one, you kind of know you're fucking up when you're doing it. Yeah. And yeah. I just think, and so there's a lot, and so you just go, and you're, you're prepared, and you've trained for it, you know what I mean, right? Yeah. And you're out there with all your senses alive, and I just think that Great. Go for it. Give it your best shot. Yeah. This is your life. Go live it to the fullest. Mm-hmm, mm-hmm. What's been the most scary thing as a mother of uh, and, and a wife of um, of men who, who are who are ballsy, let's just say, you know, charging? No, I think it's I, I see that part doesn't scare me because they're prepared for it. They're mm-hmm. they're training for it. That's what they do. Mm-hmm. There's other bad decisions that they may have made that mm-hmm. are kind of make you heart sick because you know that it's going to be very difficult on them long term and and so those are the things that hurt you Mm -hmm. not not the physical stuff that they're going out and doing Mm -hmm. that's not they're they're supposed to do that yeah yeah (laughs) they've been trained to do that yeah yeah you know to kind of put themselves to pit themselves against nature Uh uh-huh uh-huh um what about hawaii you spent many years there yeah Uh, yes off and on uh, and Lately, I haven't been there. Well, these last few years, traveling was just such a nightmare and stuff, right? But I've started a new adventure. Uh, Grace and I have started a new business venture that's kind of interesting, right? And so it things change, right? And so because things kind of slow down about going to Hawaii, then that energy has to go someplace, mm-hmm, mm-hmm. you know? Yeah. Um, you and Herbie got to hang out with Jimi Hendrix during the whole Rain- Rainbow Bridge, Maui, uh, Haleakala uh-huh. Crater show and all uh-huh. that. What was that like? I, that was right before he passed away, you know, and I think he was the same as so many other people um, that have so much on them that they don't know who likes them, who doesn't like them. Do you understand? I think being famous is very difficult for most people. Mm-hmm. I don't think it's what it's cracked up to be. Mm-hmm. And I think he died not too long after that. Did he know that something was coming? Do you? Yeah. There's a lot of people I've known that have passed away. And yeah. so when I think back and think about it, was their spirit starting to leave already? Mm-hmm. Was there some sense of foreboding in them? Yeah. I don't I don't know. But when I think about it, sometimes I think, whoa, there was something kind of unsettling. Yeah. Yep. You've um you have many friends who are high profile or, or shall we call them famous. Your um what's your take on on fame, on seeing people live very public lives? I think some of it's, you know, I think it depends upon the person. Some people, it's easier for them than mm-hmm. others. Mm-hmm. Some people, they're they're able to understand, oh, it's just what I do. It's not who I am. Yeah. You know what I mean? And it depends upon how much people kind of want to encroach upon that. But I think some people definitely are more able to handle it. Mm-hmm. Like Christian said, being famous just makes life more inconvenient unless mm-hmm. you're getting paid a whole lot of money. Mm-hmm. <laughs> <laughs> And I thought, oh, that's kind of funny, right? 
you know. Yeah. What is most exciting and inspiring for you at this point in life? What what uh, what do you look forward to? Every day I'm so excited. I get up like about 4, 4.30 because I can't wait for the day to begin. Because every day it's always an opportunity for some new adventure. Mm -hmm. Now, my adventure may not be as physical now because I am older. Do you understand? So maybe I'm not looking to do that 25-mile run. But just like I said, I started this whole NFT thing with Grayson. I'm getting those new goggles so I can do the metaverse. I said, oh, this is a whole new opportunity to do something interesting and new. Yeah. And it really is. Yeah. It is. The same vocabulary, it, it, it's the same thing I've always done, but it's a new vocabulary. Mm -hmm. And so it makes it interesting. Yep. Now, as long as I've known you, Dibby, you've always been so inspired and so fired up. And I've always, I've always appreciated that and, 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 and felt it when I'm near you. What is like, what, so you get up that early in the morning, what's your daily, how does your day, typical day go? <laughs> Well, first of all, I start looking at all this stuff, all this new metaverse and NFT stuff. I mean, it's fascinating. It, it's all, it goes on the blockchain, the same as cryptocurrency. And you just go, oh my God, there's a whole world happening out there. And so I think that that's really exciting. And so it's like doing art and everything, but it's a whole new way to explore it. And, and so that's new. It's dynamic and it's fast and it's youthful and all these things. And so I kind of study it. Mm -hmm. So I spend an hour or two kind of paying attention and studying it and look what's what what new who's buying the new board eight the yacht club uh, characters and all this and i think that that's a fascinating way to stay engaged yeah sure you know and because i think that the surf surf and skate and all that has changed so much okay just like my last order of astrodeck it was seventeen hundred dollars usually to bring it in now it was sixty seven hundred wow it's changed covid is that uh, or is that just inflation in general well, it's part, part inflation, part a part that they can. And so you go, so are, are you able to keep doing this? Mm -hmm. Or has it changed so much that you're going to have to look at something completely new and different? Yeah. And that's what I'm thinking. The world is not the same. Yep. COVID sped that change up. But the way, the way it is now... I can't do things the same as I did five years ago. Yeah. There is no way. And yep. so you go, okay, so what does that look like? So how do I take everything I have, all this history and all this art and everything else, how do I take that and create a new vocabulary that is appropriate in this day and time? Yep. Yeah. Adapting to it. Yeah. 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 It hasn't been easy, though. I mean, I, I, I myself have felt it and certainly so many people I'm close to. I don't know anyone who hasn't been hit by it on some level, whether it's marriages collapsing, whether it's jobs ending, um, careers kind of dwindling. Um, but yeah, it's been, it hasn't been the easiest time to keep the spirit up. No, and that's what I'm saying. So I, so all of a sudden I got into this and I said, Oh my God, this is so exciting. I'm absolutely fired up. Yeah. And so you go, okay, that is the difference being fired up about something Yes. because I cannot live the same life I lived five years ago. That life is gone. Yeah. Whether, and see most people, they can't stand that idea because they go, well, I didn't do anything to have that happen. Honey, it doesn't matter if you did it or not, it happened. So you might as well get used to it. So what's next? Yeah, yeah. And so that's what I see. I think too many people, just like you said, marriages are in, people had an expectation that their life was going to go on. Yeah. And because they didn't change what they were doing and their life completely changed, they're angry. Mm-hmm, mm-hmm. And they don't know how to move forward. Yeah. You go, okay, I didn't do anything to change. But I said, okay, but the world changed around me. So I guess I got to do something new. Yeah. And so I think that that is finding that, whether it's that pioneer spirit in you. Yeah. I said, oh my goodness, there has to be something new out there. And there really is. You just got to kind of look for it and be engaged. Yeah. You've never been self-pitying at all, have you? You, I, no one gives a shit. Yeah. So why bother? Yeah. What about? Um, I remember maybe it was back when I was when I, so I was the editor of Surfing Magazine from 1998 to 2000, and you guys had Astro Deck adjacent. We shared a wall. In fact, my office was right against yours, and I would see you guys every single day, which was really wonderful. Um, at the time, I remember you'd written I want to say a memoir, or you've written something about the family. You'd written an entire book about the family. Is that? Oh, I've done a couple of different things. That's when I got that HBO deal. Yes. Yeah, I got a five. I got green light at HBO deal in fifteen minutes, and then I got screwed completely out of it in the next fifteen. <laughs> but it was, but it was an interesting. It was an interesting time. So how did? Okay, so so you written the book, um, or was it a screenplay? It was more of a memoir. Okay, so you wrote a memoir, and then it got to HBO, and they said, "Let's let's um, adapt this into a TV series." And it was John from Cincinnati, if I remember. Well, because I went. 
I was at Bruce Weber's and the, there was these guys there. They turned out to be these Hollywood agents. So when I got back from the Adirondacks within the next week, I had a meeting with Ari Emanuel, who was the top agent mm -hmm. in Hollywood, mm -hmm. right? So two days, so I went up and met him. And so he's kind of what you think he's like, you know? Anyway, I don't care. I've been around a lot of guys. Mm -hmm. And so I don't care. I'm not intimidated by some guy. I don't care if he's famous. What's that mean to me? Mm -hmm. I do not give a shit. So anyway... <laughs> So we went on and then like the next week we had a meeting. So it was kind of interesting because I was kind of out there on my own, right? And so David Milch picked it up. He turned it into his. Him and Ari got, they split the pie, right? And I got some consulting fee. But the, the show was a huge bomb. See, I was there and I kept telling him what I found interesting. It was a $220 million production. And none of them knew that the story wasn't any good. So they basically, they, they started taking license and shifting it further further away from the facts and, and making it more fictional, in other words, right? Well, yeah, they didn't use my story at all. Yeah. And they never bought my story. Uh -huh. So they had no rights to anything about my story or anything else. But they thought I was such a feeble idiot that I was going to say, oh, okay. Yeah. Forget well, it. Yep. What I know is the story of my family should be kept intact. Yep. I did a book uh, two years, was it two years now? With Rizzoli. Mm -hmm. And then COVID happened. I was going out and doing kind of like this book tour and everything. And it was just a nice book. I got Bruce Weber to write in it. I got Julian. I got um, uh, Robert Trujillo from Metallica. Yep. Uh, Mike D from the, uh, from the Beastie Boys. And all these different people to write different things, right? And so it was really nice. Barry McGee, mm -hmm. you know. And so it was very nice. And I got to do... A little something on my dad and my sister because they, you know, they have a word thing. Oh, you can only do X amount of words. Yep. But it's a beautiful picture book that I got to do. And so just like somebody recently, they wanted to buy Astrodeck. And it was very interesting even thinking about that. The point is, is Astrodeck is so closely tied to the Fletcher family. Yeah. To sell Astrodeck, what they really want is my history. Mm -hmm. Well... Why would I let someone else have my history yeah. and tell my story? That would be a very foolish mistake. Yeah. Yeah, interesting. I would imagine, and uh, I've even spoken to you about it over the years, but there are probably a lot of people very interested in the Fletcher story for uh, movie, television, books, etc. right? I mean, you've, you've probably been hit up many, many times for people that want to... But see, unless they want to do it my way, I'm not interested. Yeah. yeah. They weren't there. Yeah. So if they want to get in, that's the point. People want, oh, yes, I really want to do your story. No, you don't. You want to do what you think my story is. Yeah, yep. What about, you guys had an um, exhibition at the Gagosian Gallery in New York uh, a couple of years ago. And right? it was based on the book that okay. I did. And it was really nice. Okay. They did a wonderful job of putting it together, you know. And it started kind of with my dad and some of the boards that Herbie had made that were um, kind of reminiscent of my dad's generation. Mm -hmm. And so it was really nice. And they had a wonderful, like, gift shop with all sorts of memorabilia and stuff. It was very nice. They oh, did that's, a very nice job. That's really cool. With, you know, with the, um, with the hash tag Fletcher DNA what why why do you think your family has been so full of extremely talented surfer skater snowboarder BMXer you know there's this like there's no one I, I always say Fletcher DNA it's a gene pool of cool <laughs> <laughs> but I thought see and I did Fletcher DNA because to me that says something that it's just this kind of gene pool mm -hmm. of this really kind of extreme kind of go for it, right? And I think that Herbie, Herbie was very go for it, but Herbie's very gentle. Yeah. So I think he allowed the kids to come into their own without yeah. being too aggressive about it, like a lot of men are, which yeah. makes it harder for that that boy to kind of explore what he can do. Yeah. You know, and so do I think that they got to travel with the best Yep. So from the time they were, just like Laser and Jetson, I mean, they're with the best surfers in the world. They And so they're used to it, right? And so they'll progress in a way that's faster because they have the greatest around them. Yeah. And so it was the same with my kids, yep. you know? Yeah. It's four generations, actually, because I think of, um, I remember a, a surfer or surfing magazine through the in the 80s, it would have been, there was Flippy Hoffman on an outrigger canoe at, uh, it was not Himalayas, but Avalanche near Haliva. Mm -hmm. Riding giant waves. Mm -hmm. So you've got big. So you are you're the daughter of big wave surfers, sister of a multiple world champion, 
mother of an aerial pioneer and and Nathan on the most terrifying way to I think and see that and I think that I have one of the most interesting positions in surf because no one is connected to it in as many different ways as I am. Yes. Which is yeah. really interesting. And so I ended up writing for like a skate magazine and stuff. And I've written for Citizens of Humanity and all this, right? I've written a lot for Bruce Weber for Italian Vogue and yep. everything. Yep. And I think it's because I have a uniquely, I've had this bird's eye kind of view of surf, skate and everything, right? And I didn't do it. And because I'm a woman, I have a bit of a different idea about it, right? And yeah. so I think it's interesting. No, I think so too. And you guys have always been, you've inspired me. You've always had really interesting friends. I mean, you've had a you, you've had a long friendship with Bruce Weber. You've had a long friendship with Julian Schnabel. Surfing, when I came to surfing, the, the tentacles didn't reach to New York so much. There was, it didn't seem like if I went to New York, I was a, a long way from the surf world, whereas now you see a lot more kind of overlap. Christian, Christian was one of the first surfers that went into pop culture. Uh-huh. He really flew into pop culture. Yeah. So Bruce Weber came and he got in touch with us to put Christian in an interview magazine. Mm -hmm. So Christian was one of the first surfers that went from surfing into this pop culture icon. Yep. You know, they Guns N' Roses played his video at the openings of their shows, mm -hmm. right? And so I think that because he was just kind of wild, right? He was rock and roll. Yeah. And the surf industry didn't like it. That's how conservative they had become. Yeah. But the outer world thought, oh, my God, that's fantastic, yeah. right? Yeah. And so I think that he really kind of took it out there into that other world, right? A lot of the great fashion photographers wanted to shoot him and everything because he was so extreme. He didn't look surf. See, mm -hmm. he didn't want to. Mm -hmm. He had his mohawk and his yeah. tattoos. And, and he was really one of the first surfers to really kind of have that kind of body art and to explore that side. Yeah. Yep. You know, yeah. he didn't, he goes, I never want to look like a surfer. Yeah. And then he'd wear those cabana outfits where he'd have the matching print shorts and shirt and stuff. Right. And you just go, oh, Christian, only you. Yeah. And that was the point. Only him. Yeah. With his Doc Martens on and stuff. Yeah. Right. Yeah, yeah. And so I think that he was very much kind of this fashion guy without being a fashion guy. Yeah. And I would imagine that that's made the whole ride a lot more interesting for you because this, as you said earlier, the surfing can be so homogenized and I would imagine... <laughs> Yeah, I mean, getting outside of the surf world and meeting people in fashion and the visual art world, etc. Well, yeah, that was interesting, right? Because then, it, then that was inspiring for me. Yeah. I've always loved art. I love fashion, right? You know, I always had these weird hairdos. In fact, Nathan always looked at me. I was a room mother. Mm -hmm. And I had a big bleach blonde ratted hair with long earrings on and stuff. Jerry Lopez always likes to tell the story that I had to go to parent teacher conference because Christian was not behaving well. And so they'd send the parent to go to every class with the kid. And so I told Christian, I said, you know, Christian, I didn't like going to school myself. So if I'm going, I'm going. And so I have my leather, my red leather mini skirt, my fishnet hose, my purple boots with uh, spikes on them, a giant ratted hairdo, and a chain mail shirt. And I arrived in the morning and Christian just went, oh, oh. And all his friends were, they were quite amazed. And so I said, Christian, I said, now I'll tell you something. I have another outfit picked out. If we have to do this again, he said, I swear to God, I will be good no matter what, <laughs> you know. That's so good. But, I mean, you know, it was just, you know, fashion and you just go, why not push the envelope and everything? Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. You know, I think it's yeah. important. Yeah, I think so too. Um, talking about your unique sort of window or perspective into all this, what if you were, and I know this is a kind of one of those questions that's sort of an absurd question, but I'll, I'll ask it anyway. What have you learned from it all? What, what's sort of like your takeaway or thesis or conclusion um, having watched, you know, having been on the ride with Herbie all these years and then with your children. I do, I have a piece of marital advice if you'd like it. I'd love that. Okay. As I said, we've been married, what, 53 years and lived together 55. So somebody asked me, well, you know, do you have a piece of advice? I said, yeah, don't talk to each other when you're tired. I like that. <laughs> <laughs> and they looked at me and I said, well, honestly, I said, when you're tired, nothing works right. Uh -huh. And I said, so just shut up and go to your own room. Nice. Right? And I said, the next day, it won't even matter. Yeah. That's very good. What about parental advice? But I mean, that, and that is so true, isn't it? Mm. And let's see, parental advice. I'm so grateful to be a mom. 
Mm -hmm. It was really just the most wonderful experience. And yes, a lot of it was harrowing and hard and, you know, heartbreaking and everything else. But boy, what a life. Well, you've always, and, and having known you guys for so many years now, you've always had such a optimism and real open-mindedness towards things. In other words, like tough things can be, in fact, part of your education and learning experience. That's where you learn stuff. Yeah. Honey, you don't learn stuff when you're feeling good and happy. Yeah. That's not the learning curve. Yeah. That's the icing on the cake. Yeah. But where you learn stuff is when you have to really dig in yeah. to find out who you are to go through that tough stuff that everyone has. Yeah. Everyone has that. Yeah. No one's spared. Yeah. And so I think it's very interesting when people think, Oh, you've been spared all that, so you don't know. And so they kind of are aggressive in trying to make you feel not good. Mm -hmm. I've, I've noticed that a lot with people. Like when they come to interview and stuff, they don't want to interview you. They want to prove a point that they think, mm -hmm. especially with, when it's with Christian yeah, or when they talk about him. Mm -hmm. And you go, well, what's wrong with your life <laughs> that, that that's what you want to do? Yeah. Do you understand? Sure. I don't think that it was probably easy for Christian to be Christian in a lot of ways. Yeah. I think that he certainly had his own road that he had to traverse, right? Um, but just like I said, I love being a parent. I, there was so much about it that was difficult, right? But, I, you know, I see Grayson all the time now, and that's so wonderful. And he always hugs me and kisses me, and Christian hugs me and kisses me. And, of course, there's water under the bridge, and there's a lot of stuff that went on. But in the end, you go, boy, I could call them, and they'd understand exactly what I was talking about. And if I needed them, they'd be there. That's nice. What you've been interviewed many times. What what is never brought up that you would like to talk about? What have we not covered in this conversation that you'd like to? Um, I don't know. Am I supposed to say something poignant about no, about what it's like? You know, in this, it was kind of interesting being in the surf world because I didn't surf and everything. But I think in reality, I've been treated very well. Um, I love going to the North Shore. They're all so nice and kind to me, and I think very respectful, which I really like. And I think that the stories need to be told by people that were there. Mm -hmm. Do you understand? Mm -hmm. Because I think so much is changed by people. I think most of people now that want to write about surfing, they've read a few things on Google, you know, and so then they want to go and talk about it. But it's different if you've been there through that time. There was a different soundtrack. Yeah, sure. There was, everything was different. And so I think it's important for a lot of those stories to be told by people that were there. That's one reason Herbie and I went and interviewed a lot of the old guys before they passed away and stuff. So you have it in their words. Yeah. Because so much gets changed through the rewriting of things. Yep. It's that like that old game that you played telephone. Yeah. By the time it gets sure. to the first person, the conversation yeah. isn't anywhere near the same. Yep. And so I've been very lucky that I've had the opportunity to write some things. Just like I said, interviewing my sister was interesting mm -hmm. because I got to talk to her. I lived in the same room with her, mm -hmm. you know, and I got to talk to her about how she got her sponsors. I was young and I didn't pay attention. So when she said, well, you know, I used to write to companies. She goes, they didn't give me any money, but like Samsonite gave me luggage. Mm -hmm. Triumph gave me a car. Mm -hmm. And so I thought, oh, that's so much different than now. Do you yeah, understand, sure. right? Yep. Where she would do that in the evenings. Mm -hmm. And we talked about her being in the right place at the right time. She had the right look. It was right after Endless Summer that became an international success because mm -hmm. it wasn't so much a surf movie as it was a buddy movie. Mm -hmm. And so it took surfing out into a whole big world, right? Yeah, yep. And so she had good grades. She was, a, uh, you know, she was um, the student body president and all these things. She goes, so I was the right look at the right time. Mm -hmm. What is your take on, do you think, um, thinking about the time when you when you came into the surf world and, and compared to now, do you think women are getting a better, a fairer shake than they used to? Do you feel like it's changing in the right direction? What's your take there? Um. Well, I think women all over are, are it's changing everywhere. Yeah. Do you understand, yeah. right? Um, like people ask me, it was funny because Grace and I were having this Zoom call. And when we got off, it, Grace and said, you know, he goes, they were kind of weird. I said, well, they think I'm an old broad and don't give a shit. And I said, Grayson, just like you thought. <laughs> so he had to laugh because Grayson had told me not too long ago, he goes, well, I thought you were too old to get it. Mm -hmm. I said, that shows how young and dumb you are, you know? <laughs> So anyway, but I'm just saying that I, 
men are men and women are women and it's always going to be the same. There's always going to be a struggle. Am I always going to get treated the same? I don't want to get treated the same as Herbie. Mm -hmm. I want to get treated like Dibby. Yeah. Yeah. (laughs) I don't need to be treated like him. Yeah. And so I think that becomes, I think that was kind of an issue. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. All of a sudden people are saying, oh, well, I want to, you know, I want it all to be the same. Nature's nature. Sure. And I don't want to be treated like Christian. Yeah. Yeah. (laughs) I prefer being treated like me. Mm -hmm. Do you understand? Mm -hmm. And so I think if we have that as an understanding, I think that then it starts to flow a lot better. Yeah. Yep. That's good. Um, Anything else that you want to touch on? No. Well, I will say that I'm kind of, it's going to be fun to go see my sister get, um, uh, do the unveiling of a life-size bronze in Dana Point, that the city of Dana Point is recognizing her for her surfing. I think that's something that's, really that's cool. kind of interesting, right? Mm-hmm. She'll be there. I think there's um, John Severson and Hobie, and I think they're going to do something with my dad and my uncle. But nice. that's kind of a step forward for women surfing, right, if you will, right? And so I think that that's interesting. My dad just got... Um, board builder, you know, a board builder's award, right? That Herbie helped him get. And so there's been recognition of different things. But I, in all in all, I think that Herbie and I have done, we've lived the life we wanted to and we've lived it our way. Yeah. You know, and we never really had partners. And maybe we could have been more successful financially had we had partners. But then somebody else would have had a say about what we what we did. Mm-hmm, mm-hmm. And this way, we were completely responsible for the good, the bad, the ugly, whatever. Mm-hmm. And we did it our way. And I think that that's w- what a great American story. Yeah, it is. And I've been inspired by it for many years. You know, I think that. The, and so in essence, it's we couldn't have happened anywhere else but America. Yeah. Yeah. I thought I was thinking I was going to say that earlier. It's classically American. And what, what's nice, and I'm among many, many of them because you guys have so many friends and now it spans sort of generations. But, um, you know, we it's it's been inspirational to watch. It really has. Not only in the taking, like pushing yourself in the ocean and the way in which you ride waves, but in a way how you model your life, how you design your life. I think um, I know I've looked to you guys for many years going, oh, that's a great way to live the life. And I was a young punk rocker. And my inspirations in my teenage years were dudes with mohawks and spiky hair and all that kind of stuff. I had one of those. <laughs> <laughs> I loved it. <laughs> but but now at this stage of life, looking at it, it it's um, it's just interesting. I realize it's not easy to sustain one's um, individuality and kind of staying true to themselves throughout decades of life. It's not an easy thing to do. You know what? In a way, that that's correct. Well, just like me, I people have an expectation of what I'm supposed to be like. I'm sorry. I told somebody the other day, I'm sorry if I don't fit that, yeah. that, but that's not my problem. That's yours. Yeah. Yeah. Do you understand? It was this guy and he was kind of upset that I behaved the way I did is what it seemed like. And I thought, oh, you're sitting in judgment on me because you have an expectation that a woman my age should be a certain way. Mm-hmm. Fuck you and your expectation. I am what I am, and I'm grateful for it, right? <laughs> and I just thought that that was kind of interesting, right? By the time he left, he shook my hand and said, I want you to know this has been really interesting. <laughs> and I'm hoping that he has a broader view of what people can be. Yeah. That's, you a, that's a great gift you can give people. You know, and because I think that's important because I am a woman of a certain age, I'm supposed to behave like your grandmother. Oh, I'm sorry. <laughs> yeah. Maybe your grandmother should behave like me. Yeah. She'd probably have a lot more fun. <laughs> and I just think if I'm a good wife, if I'm a good grandmother and all these things, what more could anybody expect? Yeah. You know, you go, then I've done a good job. Mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. Um, thanks so much, Debbie, for making the time. It's so great to chat with you. Yeah, you're welcome anytime. Great. Soundings is produced by me, Jamie Brissick, and Jonathan Shiflett. You can find it on Apple, Stitcher, and Spotify. Our theme song is Ocean Parkway by the Gun Trusinski Duo. You can find more of their music on Spotify. Soundings is brought to you by The Surfer's Journal, a reader-supported publication made possible by sponsorship from Birdwell, FCS, Patagonia, Rainbow, Vans, Bisla, and Yeti. The Surfer's Journal is published six times a year, along with the magazine. Subscribers receive unlimited access to every article from its 30-year archive, 
as well as members-only access to additional digital content, exclusive film screenings, and sponsor offers. For more information, visit surfersjournal.com. Thanks again for listening to Soundings, and we will see you again. Thank you.